introduce Tim. Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Tim Billow. Tim has spoken to our group before. Tonight, he's back to talk to us about the latest updates on the sword fern die-off. Tim is a lecturer with the University of Washington program on the environment. The focus of his position is undergraduate teaching. He teaches a wide range of interdisciplinary courses, often centered around field study and natural history. He also teaches several novel and innovative summer field courses, one of which involves a nine day trek into the Olympic wilderness. Tim earned his PhD in biology with a specialty in bird behavior and evolution. Much of his research took place in the lowland tropical rainforests of Central America. With a lifelong interest in plants, however, and two small children at home, he welcomed the opportunity to work on the sword fern die-off problem affecting Seward Park, a field site in his own neighborhood. I know you all join me in giving Tim a warm wel welcome. Thanks, Tim. Okay, thank you, Shelley. Um, can I hope everyone can hear my voice okay. Uh, I can't see everyone's faces out there, so uh, I think that's just the way this is set up. But if you do have questions or you can't hear me, uh, please feel free to, I don't know, voice your concern. I think there's a chat box set up and maybe a Q&A box set up as well for uh, questions and answers. And I think that Shelly will be monitoring that. Um, but at any rate, Shelly, thank you for the introduction. And thank you to the Washington Native Plant Society for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, I'm a big fan of the Washington Native Plant, Native Plant Society and the work you all do. So thank you so much for uh, your work and your membership in this important society. And again, it's my pleasure to talk to you all tonight. Um, and so without further ado, I do want to talk about the Puget Sound region sword fern die-off syndrome. Uh, that's what we're calling it now, I think. And uh, maybe we're still trying to come up with exactly what the right name for it should be. Uh, there's my email address on the first slide here. So if you do have questions that don't get answered tonight and you'd like to follow up with me, I'd welcome communication via email at a later date. So before I go any further, I do want to uh, make some acknowledgments. And the first acknowledgment I'd like to make is that we are here on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle. And specifically, Seward Park is uh, on the land of the inside people, the Hachuapsh, the uh, people of Lake Washington. And I think it's not only important to recognize the Duwamish people and their sovereignty over this land, and to thank them for stewarding this land, landscape since time immemorial. But I think it's also important to think about the legacy of uh, ecosystem management uh, practiced by the Duwamish people. And in particular, uh, the people who were living in known village sites around Seward Park, to the, what we call today Seward Park, Squabuxed in the uh, Ushutsid language. Um, and in particular, you know, we know about the legacy of intentional burning of the ecosystem, and we still see that legacy today in Seward Park, as evidenced by fire scars on trees, as evidenced by the oak savannas on the south shore of the Bailey Peninsula, and even along the shoreline all the way down to Martha Washington Park. So. Again, I, I think it's important that we think about that history and acknowledge that history for a variety of reasons, uh, not the least of which I think it helps us understand the, uh, the communities, the ecological communities that we're working in and, and the development and evolution of those communities over time. Um, I do wanna make a number of other acknowledgements here. And in particular, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to Paul Shannon, who is a volunteer steward in Seward Park. And I would say that much of the work that I'm going to talk about today was spearheaded by Paul Shannon. And I, I would just say that Paul Shannon has been 
stalwart not only in defending the uh, health of the magnificent forest in Seward Park, but in really bringing together a really diverse group of people to shed some light on this problem, this, the uh, sword fern die-off syndrome. And um, yeah, I, I, again, I just, um, we're, I think we are all indebted to Paul for his efforts in this area. Um, additionally, I'd like to thank David Parasso, um, whose work I'll also be highlighting tonight. Uh, David is a forest steward for Martha Washington Park, and obviously he's very involved with Seward Park as well. Uh, Dylan Mendenhall's work will also be highlighted tonight. D Dylan Mendenhall actually was a former student of mine, uh, but he's gone on to uh, really amazing things. He's uh, an amazing biologist and uh, he's done quite a bit of graduate work and he runs his own consulting firm now called Haven Ecology. And so we are indebted, indebted to Dylan as well for his work on this sword fern die-off syndrome. All three of these people have done some really creative thinking about the issue and, and uh, you'll see that they are helping us to approach this sword fern die-off syndrome in some really novel and creative ways. Uh, we have a number of undergraduates who have been involved with this research, Natalie Schwartz, Kramer Knup, Andres Barrera, and Justin Beach. Uh, they've all graduated now, but uh, it's been a great opportunity for these, for a number of different undergrads, including these folks, and uh, we're indebted to them too for their efforts. Uh, Nelson Salisbury, with EarthCore has been uh, instrumental in helping us set up a number of these projects and uh, donating time, energy, data. Uh, Olga Kildesheva and uh, Matthew Agai of Verdant Consulting uh, have been important contributors to this work as well. Uh, Marianne Elliott and Jenny Glass of uh, the WSU Extension Puyallup are also important collaborators. Uh, we go to them for advice and knowledge on forest pathogens. And in particular, these two folks, uh, excellent researchers have been working on, uh, or at least a few years ago, we, we were looking at Phytophthora as a possible uh, pathogen that was affecting sword ferns. And they've uh, done a lot of work on that and helped us rule out Phytophthora as the uh, source of the problem that we're seeing. Um, Al Smith with WNPS and the Friends of Seward Park uh, is one of my personal heroes. Uh, you'll see him out there on his bike visiting uh, any number of parks around this region, uh, documenting native plants, uh, pulling out weeds, doing restoration work. And I would have to say that, you know, Al Smith is um, one of the people who's been so instrumental in keeping non-native species out of Seward Park and, and uh, maintaining the uh, magnificent forest uh, as, as well as it has been maintained over the years. Uh, Sharon Baker with WNPS, Friends of Lincoln Park has done some nice work helping us uh, understand the phenology of healthy sword ferns. Catherine Alexander uh, with Friends of Seward Park was the person who first noticed the sword fern die-off and brought it to our attention. Um, and she's continued to be involved with this. She is a very keen naturalist. And uh, we've gotten grant funding from a group called 100 Women Who Care. You can see this giant check here. And I do mean that it was a physically giant check, but also a, a nice sum of money to help us out with some of our research expenses. Paul Talbert with the Friends of Seward Park has been instrumental in helping us uh, get some of the funding we need to do this. Lisa Seiko, Michael Yadrick, Seattle Parks and Rec and the Green Seattle Partnership also doing important work behind the scenes. Uh, WNPS um, has given us funding. We thank you for that. Uh, John O'Leary with Suquamish has been working on this issue out on, the, on Bainbridge Island and the Kitsap Peninsula. Uh, Joey Manson at Seward Park Audubon has hosted our group uh, for meetings at Seward Park Audubon and uh, generally provided support. Um, Olaf Ribeiro uh, has provided support with fungal analysis. And then we have 
two researchers, Aaron and Caleb from down in Portland uh, at Reed College who came up here and worked on the problem for a summer with us and plus many, many others. But I, I, you know, I just, again, wanted to acknowledge these folks at the outset, um, lest you think that this is all my work because it's really not. And in fact, most of it's not my work. And, and it really is an amazing collaboration amongst um, just a really dynamic group of people who are concerned and mostly volunteering their time to do this. So it gets pretty crazy when we're all in the park together. This is what it looks like when we head out uh, into the park to do our research. All right, well, that, that's a joke, but uh, um, that, that was Joe Biden's motorcade heading into Seward Park um, a few weeks ago. I know many of you saw that. And, um, I just thought I'd throw that in there. It was a historic moment in the history of Seward Park. And, you know, it's actually not surprising that they chose Seward Park as the place to unveil this uh, Earth Day initiative for old growth forests. And it, it really is a special place. If you haven't been there, um, I recommend going there. And it really is the lungs of our, certainly our neighborhood. Um, that forest is, in a way, the lungs of Seattle. It's literally and figuratively a breath of fresh air when you visit the magnificent forest in Seward Park. And I was there today, in fact, and it just transports you into a different kind of place. But uh, all of us who work there, unfortunately, realize that uh, the forest is not as healthy as it might be. And we're noticing signs of stress on that ecosystem. And um, that's unfortunate, and that's why we are all here contributing our time to uh, address that, these issues, um, and uh, yeah, hopefully make sure that that magnificent forest is there for many centuries to come. So finally, I get to the outline of my talk. Um, I'll start by uh, giving you a little bit of background on the issue. I'll then talk about what we're doing, what we're finding, and I'll give you a little bit of discussion uh, about the future as well. And thank you all for being here, by the way. I know it's um, Thursday night. There's a lot of you here. I, I appreciate your time and, uh, and then your interest in this. And I apologize if I'm gonna go over something you already know, but I am gonna start at the beginning uh, just for those who might not know about the issue here. Um, I'll try to move through some of the older material as quickly as I can within reason. So all of you know sword fern, I'm sure, Ballisticum monitum. It's a widespread and adaptable species that ranges from Southeast Alaska all the way down to Southern California along the coast. It likes these more moist uh, coniferous forests. That's, I would say, the ideal habitat. Um, but uh, it can be found from full sun out in clear cuts uh, to very deep shade in, in younger forests. Uh, it can be found ideally in coniferous forest from the perspective of the plant, but also in deciduous forest. So it's a very adaptable species, but where it um, really thrives, you'll see these um, really monotypical stands, if you will, of sword fern on the forest floor. Um, it's quite an amazing species. Here's a photo I took at Tiger Mountain earlier this week, and you can see in this moist hemlock forest up there on the mountain, um, the understory just full of sword fern in a habitat with, um, you know, like I said, very moist, somewhat shaded, uh, cool. This is where sword fern really seems to thrive. Yet, as I uh, went about my hike up there on the mountain, I also noticed in some of the younger forests, uh, sword fern was maybe not thriving, but present in these very shaded habitats. And in fact, it was the only uh, herbaceous species on the forest floor uh, in that habitat. So again, illustrating how uh, tolerant the species is of a variety of conditions. Okay. So this brings me to Seward Park. Um, again, most of you are probably familiar with Seward Park, but if you're not, um, it is a, on a peninsula in Lake Washington, 
uh, down here in South Seattle. Uh, we call it an early old growth forest. That's a term coined by Jerry Franklin's lab at the University of Washington. It has many of the characteristics of old growth, but the forest canopy um, is maybe not quite as open as a true old growth forest, an older old growth forest. Um, and there's probably less coarse woody debris in Seward Park's forest than you would find in a uh, older old growth forest. So we call it early old growth. It's a remnant or fragment of the original forest that covered uh, most of Seattle's landscape um, prior to European settlement. It's a robust ecosystem, yet vulnerable, as I've mentioned. Um, it's uh, seeing signs of stress. There are invasive species in the forest. It's experiencing heat island effects, um, especially because it is actually an island or a peninsula. It's a fragment. It receives the effect of sun and wind from all sides. It also receives very heavy use by people and pets. Um, and as I said, there's a real somewhat lack of coarse woody debris, large downed trees in the forest. And that's partially due to the historical harvest of coarse woody debris, uh, especially during the Great Depression for firewood. And that historical legacy may be important today and uh, important to the sword fern story. I'll get to that later. Um, but here's really the heart of the issue. So um, this is a repeat photograph, 2017, uh, repeated after this 2011 photograph. You can see the same view, same time of year, just six years apart. And it was around uh, 2013 when Catherine Alexander first noticed the uh, ferns looking sick and starting to die. And within about two years, this lush understory that you see here in 2011, um, by about 2015, it had become a virtually barren understory with only a few remaining ferns uh, in that understory. And so we were all shocked by this and we had already begun to study it at this point. Um, and uh, we were scrambling to figure out what was going on and uh, to try and mitigate the situation. And you can see here that you know this has huge, potentially huge implications for the health of this landscape overall. Um, you've lost the major species that's holding soil in place in these understory habitats. This has huge ramifications for, um, especially on a steeper slope, landslides. Um, sedimentation of rivers that could affect salmon populations. Um, we also see that, you know, that whatever animals use sword fern, and there are many, um, including the Pacific wren, and here in Seward Park, uh, mountain beavers, one of our native rodents that actually eats sword fern and depends on sword fern in the winter, especially, um, are going to be affected by the loss of this really important uh, species in the understory. And I should say that Seward Park is one of the last places in Seattle where uh, mountain beavers actually are maintaining a foothold. Um, one of the things we're doing is documenting uh, this sword fern die-off syndrome across the region. And this is a map from our iNaturalist page where all of you can log observations as you go about your explorations of this region. All of the red dots here uh, denote areas where sword fern die-off has been noticed by uh, citizens uh, who are out there exploring. And one of the things, so this is a very useful map. It gives us a sense of uh, potentially where the die-off is, where it's spreading. Um, Obviously, there's some bias here in terms of where people like to hike, where our population centers are, uh, et cetera. But uh, it's, not a, it's not a uniform or random survey. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it gives us a starting point. And then what we try to do is go and check on these places that people have identified. And we try to 
characterize them or rate them according to the severity of the die-off. And the red dots on this map, uh, which is from a website set up by Paul Shannon, denote areas where we have seen fairly severe die-off similar to what I just showed you in Seward Park. And you can see a site there out on a couple, site on Bainbridge Island, site on the Kitsap Peninsula, and another site out in uh, either uh, Port Townsend or Quilcene. I'm not sure exactly which point that is there. Um, so, so we do try to follow up on those uh, sightings that uh, citizens log into iNaturalist. Um, so I already talked a little bit about what we're doing, but let's go a little further. Um, one of the things we're trying to do is describe the symptoms of the die-off, and we've really focused on doing that in Seward Park, which again is the kind of the first place. We call it the ground zero of this die-off syndrome. Uh, we've really tried to map and understand the spread of die-off within Seward Park and some other areas as well. We are monitoring the sword fern die-off in Seward Park with long-term plots, which are marked here on this map. Uh, we have several different plot studies going on. We're searching for a mechanism of the die-off using various techniques, um, including study of ecophysiology, the physiology of the ferns, in particular, how they respond to drought uh, seasonal drought in the summer. And we're looking for modes of transmission, assuming this is caused by a pathogen. And again, we are looking throughout the region to trying to figure out if there are any patterns of spread throughout the region. And finally, we've started doing some restoration and planting experiments. So in other words, experimental restoration to uh, see how we might ameliorate this problem, assuming we can't fully solve it, at least not at this moment. So here's what we're finding. Um, and I'm gonna start with a description of the symptoms um, so that you all know what to look for when you're out there. This is work done by David Parasso, uh, Kramer Knup, Dylan Mendenhall, and Sharon Baker. And uh, oh, I had a great picture of David Parasso doing this work and I sadly forgot to put it in. Sorry, David, um, but uh, anyway, I, I'll, maybe I'll put it in there for the, for the record if the slides get um, saved somewhere. So three stages of decline here. Um, we, first stage we call early stage of decline where isolated fronds show signs of stress. Um, affected fronds may display pale color similar to bleaching, uh, curling fronds and leaflets brown rotting, general loss of vigor. Um, by the middle stage of decline, so this might be a year or two in, uh, most fronds display the characteristics of stress noted in early stages. And the fronds usually appear to wilt and many of them become extremely dry. And by the late stages of decline, we see all of the fronds dying and most of them breaking off and decomposing such that you're left with this stump that we call a crown uh, that may retain, uh, sorry, which may be, remain intact for several years uh, without regenerating, or maybe it will never regenerate. Uh, so we have a lot of areas throughout Seward Park now that contain these uh, sword fern crowns or stumps. It's like a sword fern graveyard. It's quite depressing to be honest. Um, so to take a, maybe a closer look at this, here's some nice photos by Dylan Mendenhall uh, with his firm uh, Haven Ecology. Uh, this is an example of a symptomatic fern uh, showing evidence of decline over multiple years. Um, so again, look at the browning of the fronds and this particular fern that he's photographed here uh, did not produce new uh, new fronds in 2020. And that actually is the ultimate sign of the die-off is whether it produces a new cohort of fronds in any given year. I'll come back to that. But uh, again, browning of the fronds over a period of a year or two 
and eventually ceasing to produce new fronds. Here's some more photos by Dylan showing some of these uh, various phenotypes, um, which can be shown uh, on for individual ferns, sometimes all of the phenotypes together, sometimes one or a couple of them. So again, browning of the leaves, discoloration of the leaves, uh, twisting of the rachis, uh, crinkling of the leaves, and again, uh, part D here, figure D, showing the browning of a leaf compared to a healthy leaf on the right. Um, I should have said a frond, but uh, I think you know what I mean. Another thing that Dylan has uh, documented here is the ceasing of growth. So a, a new frond sprouting and then uh, essentially aborting growth in the middle of the growth season. Okay. And then part F showing uh, the browning of the tips of the frond. Okay, so these are all characteristics that can be shown together on a single fern or individually depending. Okay, to the point where you ultimately end up with this, the browning and crinkling of all of the fronds and the eventual death of the fern. This, this photo is taken on Mercer Island in Upper Luther Burbank Park. And then finally, this is what we see in Seward Park. I'll circle all of the dead ferns in the foreground here of this photo. And um, like I said, it, it's a really a fern graveyard and we see large areas of Seward Park exhibiting this uh, pattern at this point. So additional symptoms of unhealthy ferns. Um, David Parasso was the one who noted that um, ultimately the best predictor of death in ferns was whether the sword fern would uh, unfurl a new set of fronds in any given season. And what he began to notice after monitoring individual ferns for uh, sometimes periods of several years was that when they were about to die, their fronds would not unfurl. Um, they would, in other words, be what he called stillborn fronds. And that ultimately is the best predictor of death. And you can feel the fronds developing in the middle of winter. Um, sometimes they don't develop at all. That's also a predictor of death. And sometimes, again, they unfurl partially, but don't unfurl all the way. So this is a lot of detail, but I, I actually find it fascinating, and I hope you do too. Uh, we've learned a lot about sword ferns through this work, and I, um, they're just amazing organisms. So I, I'm going to keep walking you through some more photos here um, just for all of our education. I, I really think this is incredible. This is another oh, no. on a sword sorry. fern, a much bigger one. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Apparently, there is a recording in the background. So. All right, sorry, I, I'm not sure why um, that recording started, but um, this is a, what, one of the things David did was he dug up some very healthy, robust old ferns. And you can see this multi-part rhizome, it's split into three pieces. And you can see these scars where the uh, fronds have died and broken off as part of their natural growth process. So you have one end of the rhizome that's sort of the distal end, the oldest point. And you have another end, which is where the new growth occurs. And the rhizome keeps elongating in one direction as the back end or the distal end of the rhizome uh, becomes dormant. And you can again see these, um, the, these leaf scars essentially where the fronds have broken off. And you can count backwards and estimate the age of these rhizomes. And so David estimated that this individual fern was at least 30 years old based on what he was seeing here. And one of the amazing things we've realized is that these ferns may be as old as the oldest trees in the forest themselves. It appears that um, under normal circumstances, these rhizomes never really die. Um, they just keep elongating on one end and sort of uh, becoming dormant on the distal end. 
So it's amazing to think of these as sort of old growth species, an old growth um, plant along with the old growth trees. <clears throat> um, so David sliced through some healthy uh, rhizomes here to show you the emerging croziers. These are the fiddleheads about to unfurl. Um, you can see the blue arrow pointing to a healthy crozier. Uh, early in the season, this would be probably January, February. Uh, this crozier is about to emerge or unfurl. Okay. Um, and this is what it, the fiddlehead looks like when you slice through it, cross-section crozier. Okay. So this is normal behavior for healthy sword ferns. Um, also, you'll notice sori on the underside of the leaflets of the fronds. Um, these sori are, come in two rows on the, uh, on the new fronds, and then the sori actually drop off or rub off as the uh, leaflets get, or as the fronds get older. And the ferns typically retain their leaves or their fronds for uh, two to three years before they uh, drop off. Okay, um, and you can often estimate the age of these fronds by uh, sori on the underside and also where they occur within this whorl uh, within the, the structure of the sword fern. So let's take a look at unhealthy sword ferns now. This is Dylan's uh, great photography here. Again, Dylan is with Haven Ecology. And uh, you can see on the left, a healthy sword fern rhizome and on the right, uh, an unhealthy rhizome where the croziers simply aren't uh, developing in a normal way. Um, another set of photos by Dylan, again, healthy on the left, unhealthy on the right. Okay, you can see the, on the right, that this uh, symptomatic crozier just not developing and effectively becoming stillborn to use David's terminology. Okay, so this is the ultimate sign of uh, the die off and death of the fern. Okay, so in summary, we've got um, early signs of the die off include browning of fronds, sometimes a few of them, sometimes all of them, reduced production of new fronds, uh, reduced soria, soria on new fronds, which I didn't mention, twisting, crinkling, browning, wilting of leaflets and or frond tips, aborted maturation of fronds. But ultimately we need to look for the failure to produce croziers and fiddleheads, okay? And um, that, that is the ultimate sign of the die off. And death is probably most of the time gradual over a period, over a period of several years starting with these early signs and then ending with this failure to produce croziers. Okay, um, so I, I can't see um, the Q&A bar right now, but I trust that um, Shelley will let me know if there is any Q&A after each of these sections. There are two questions. Mm -hmm. um, one is a request could, could the Paul Shannon's map be shared in the chat? Um, I, I think there was a link there to get to mm -hmm. a, um, yes. mapping. Yes, that, that's right. Um, we, we can do that. Can we maybe do that at the end? I think that would be good. Yeah. Okay. And then the other question has to do with uh, somebody's observation that none of these reports are being seen from Discovery Park. Um, is it just not being observed there, or is is the park are the parks so different that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's the million dollar question for sure, um, and we don't really know why it is so patchy. Um, I mean, there are soil differences uh, probably between Discovery and Seward. Um, we are starting to look uh, for control sites, actually um, trying to understand what, you know, uh, looking for parks that are comparable to Seward in terms of the age of the forest um, and the elevation. 
Um, and obviously in the same region, we've been looking a little bit in Schmitz Park as a comparison site for Seward, but yeah, um, it's, it's really interesting. I, I don't know why um, no one's noticed this issue in discovery or we'll, we'll just assume that it doesn't exist in discovery. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. We'll, we'll talk a little bit later about um, the potential for drought stress here. And, um, you know, discovery, of course, is closer to Puget Sound and, and there could be the uh, cooling or mitigating uh, effect of, of the Puget Sound on air temperature in the summer um, that, that might play a role, especially because we, we do suspect that, um, and I'm getting ahead of myself, that the if there is a pathogen involved, it probably affects water uptake um, in the fern. But anyway, that, that's a great question. Uh, I don't have a great answer, yeah. but um, yeah. Let's, let's keep moving forward now. Um, we'll make sure you get these links later on. Um, so mapping the spread, um, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, but again, in the first you know, couple of years, we noticed this problem. Uh, this was 2016, we, we tried to map the perimeter of what we saw in Seward Park. Um, and so the lighter shaded area is what we saw in 2016. Uh, by 2017, the area had doubled from 5.1 acres to 10.3 acres. Um, so this problem was spreading fast and uh, it was spreading so fast, in fact, that we kind of gave up uh, monitoring it in this way. Um, and and we, we noticed issues cropping up in various parts of the park and such that we couldn't really put a good line around it either. Um, so this actually leads me to uh, our next map 2021. We've sort of taken a different approach where we're putting GPS points on every dead fern that we can find. Um, just to get a sense of where uh, new centers of die-off might be. And uh, I'll just give you a sense of where that is. So the black, uh, the black and yellow squares give you a sense of um, where this is on the peninsula. And so we've seen a lot of spread now from the initial area within the yellow uh, over into other parts of the Bailey Peninsula, the north end, for example. Um, I don't think any of these new sites are quite as severe as what we've seen within that yellow square, but nevertheless, it's cause for concern. Um, so this is a rough methodology here, but it gives us, again, a sense of the lay of the land. This is what it looks like in the field. And in 2021, we uh, noticed a new patch of die-off invading one of the healthier stands of sword ferns that we have in Seward Park. This is off of the windfall trail. I mean, look at this beautiful dense stand of sword fern. But again, you know, this patch of die off just slowly uh, moving in here. And, and I should say that these, this is the way it started initially in Seward Park, a small area um, that gradually expanded outward in a radial way from an initial kind of central point. In, in again, in much the way that we would expect for a disease, a pathogen of some sort. Um, and, and this, this is one of the, the sort of questions that's been bothering us. Um, you know, is it a pathogen or is it drought or some environmental factor that's, that's causing this um, abiotic factor? But um, it's it certainly given the way it seems to spread, it behaves like a pathogen, so. All right, so um, let's talk about monitoring. And, and so I've given you a little insight into the mapping, which is a form of monitoring. Um, this is work I've done with my students. Um, I'm also noting here that Nelson Salisbury and Stuart Wexler um, and Kramer Knup has actually helped them as well. They've also done some monitoring with uh, older vegetation plots that were established in 2004, I believe, in Seward Park. Uh, their results are basically the same as what I'm about to show you. So in the interest of time, I'm going to show you just the results from uh, my work with my students. And uh, in 20, 
15, we set up, we set up 20 plots uh, within this, within and around this zone of die-off that we had identified in the early years of this research. Um, these were randomly placed plots within that uh, general vicinity. They're three meters by three meters in size. They're permanent. And we've tried to survey them every years, every year. Sorry, we missed a few years in there during the pandemic, but 2015, 16, 17, 18, and 21. Okay, so I'll show you the uh, results from that. Um, this graph omits 2021, just because we counted the ferns a little differently in 2021. But you can see from 2015 to 2016, um, well, in, in 2015, only a small percentage of the ferns in these plots were entirely dead. And we, we had a, a pretty conservative measure of being dead. And to be dead, there had to be absolutely no green showing on the fern at all. So in 2015, we, we had you know, maybe, maybe 4%, 3 or 4% of the ferns in our plots were dead. 120 ferns was the sample size. By 2016, over 30% of the ferns were completely dead. And by 2018, over 50% of that initial 120 were completely dead. Um, another way to look at this is looking at the number of live fronds. Um, and we, we surveyed something like over 3,500, 3,500 live fronds initially. And um, so this is the average fronds per plot. And remember, remember there are 20 plots. So we go from about 20 fronds per plot in 2015 to um, around a little over 20 down to slightly over 10 in 2016. So a drastic shift from 2015 to 2016 and a continuing loss of live fronds all the way through 2021. Okay, but you can see that that loss has slowed somewhat over time. And to me, well, we're still continuing to lose fronds, but it, I guess it's encouraging to me that the loss is slowing a little bit. Um, but uh, nevertheless, that's what we have. We could look at this on a per plot basis, and these are the number of live fronds in each plot each year. So each line represents a different one of those 20 plots. And you can see that for the most part, uh, the majority of these plots show just a uh, either a steep or gradual decline in the number of live fronds per plot. With the exception of three plots, plot five, plot 20, and plot seven that have showed uh, more or less, um, they've more or less maintained their ferns or their fronds. But uh, Plot 20 actually is showing a pretty severe dip uh, just over the past year. And so you might ask what, what's special about these three plots? And the short answer is, I don't know for sure, but I can say, um, just to give you a little sense here, plot, uh, yeah, plot five actually is, no, plot 20 and plot seven are quite close to each other. Um, this is a view of, what plot seven looks like. It's a beautiful patch of forest with um, some very big trees around it. Um, and in particular, kind of a stand of uh, grand fir, actually large grand fir. There's a tree fall gap there. There's been um, several large trees that have fallen as well. Um, it's a fairly <clears throat> lush understory, I would say, with actually <clears throat> robust growth of a number of different kinds of herbs and shrubs, uh, including trientalis, occidentalis, um, trying to think. Um, there's some uh, uh, thimbleberry in there, uh, a lot of rubus or sinus, um, various vaccinium, uh, various other shrubs, some moss on the forest floor. It's a it's a very lush area, and for whatever reason, uh, the ferns seem to have maintained uh, their uh, fronds in this area, uh, which is interesting to me because almost everywhere around this particular site, um, there's pretty extreme die-off, um, and, and uh, so, so it's 
really quite puzzling. There's also really good reproduction of tree species in this area too, including this madrone, several madrone seedlings and several grand fir seedlings. I could show you more pictures and speculate more on this and I'd be happy to do that at the end, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna move through. But this is like this little lush surviving patch in the middle of an area that is otherwise quite barren. So now one of the things we noticed, and this is work that Paul Shannon did with his son, in fact, uh, was that of the surviving ferns, and there were a few in, and there are a few, I should say, even in areas that are hardest hit by the die-off syndrome, uh, we've noticed that the living ferns tend to cluster around logs and live trees. And uh, these ferns have survived for five years now um, going into this study. So, and it, you know, this is just to sort of situate yourself on this figure, um, the black lines are logs, the colored circles represent uh, overstory trees and maybe some understory trees too of various species. Um, the green dots are live ferns and the uh, open dots are dead ferns. So you can see a sea of dead ferns here with a smattering of live ferns. And if you do the statistical analysis on this, the live ferns are clustering closer to logs and live trees. So um, it's, it's hard to say what to make of this, except that we know that large live trees have a hydraulic effect where they draw water towards their stem. So maybe um, they're pro either providing shade or uh, keeping the soil more moist. Um, these are things that we could certainly try to test for. Um, and I think it'd be a good idea to do that. And the logs themselves may also harbor moisture and retain moisture like a much as a sponge does and somehow keep the soil around the log more moist. But for whatever reason, this is the pattern we see and it's statistically significant. Um, so this is an interesting observation at the micro scale here. And, and I should say that going back to that last slide where I was showing you that um, site where there's actually two plots that have maintained their ferns and their fronds quite well, um, you know, there is some coarse woody debris there. There's some large trees <clears throat> that have fallen. So um, maybe part of the same pattern. And again, some, like I said, some very large um, grand firs growing there around that little opening in the forest. So in summary, most of our plots have declined severely, 50 to 100% over the study period. So literally there are some plots that have lost all of their ferns during the study period and all of their live fronds. Again, uh, Nelson's work has shown the same thing um, in a slightly different way, but uh, I would say it appears that the die-off is now slowing. So these areas that showed severe loss initially are now, I would say, slowing in their loss. And I'll come back to this um, a little bit later. Um, the die-off is spreading in a patchy pattern though to other areas of the park. Um, but so far I would argue not as severe as what we saw at this initial site, which we referred to as ground zero, the original die-off site. Um, and again, survival is highest near large trees or large logs. <clears throat> so again, I brought up the idea that maybe water is at play here. So this is kind of the the big fundamental question we're trying to answer now is what's causing the die off. And um, it's very tempting to say that drought is the cause. Um, and so I'd like to explore that a little bit more right now. Oh, no. um, so that it's funny, there's an old recording embedded within this, um, this presentation. So I apologize that it keeps kicking in there. But uh, mechanisms of death, drought versus pathogen, and we've had a lot of great people working on this, including Dylan Mendenhall, uh, Verdant LLC, um, and Kramer Knup helping them, funded by Seattle Parks and Rec, Natalie Schwartz, funded by uh, WNPS, 
and other volunteer UW students. Um, so let's take a look at this. So drought versus pathogen, and that's really the, I'd say the fundamental question we're asking right now in terms of mechanisms of die off. And our initial observations, it's important to think climatologically, the last 10 years in Seattle are not characterized by drought, if you look at the data, okay? Um, last 10 years in Seattle are not characterized by abnormal average temperatures, and I'm stressing average there. Um, and just to back up, you know, we've seen some years that have been, have seen less than normal precipitation, but a lot of years with more than normal precipitation too within the last 10 years. Um, average temperatures have been about average in the last 10 years, but, and this is important, I think we all know that it's, we're becoming more likely to break high temperature records in the summer. And last summer was a, obviously a glaring example of this. Um, so I think we're seeing higher high temperatures. And if you look at the last 20 years in Seattle, we're, we see a lot of high temperature records being broken um, and virtually no low temperature records being broken that I've found in the data. So, um, and this may be important is uh, hotter, hot temperatures in the summer. And there's a lot of sources for these kind of data. Uh, seattleweatherblog.com is one website um, where a lot of these data are compiled. We, we actually worked with a UW researcher out of uh, Cliff Mass's lab to really get a better sense of some of these climatological data. Ah. Okay, so, um, looking at 2018, which is when we did this study, um, you can see the percent soil moisture in Seward Park. Um, and you see this trend with higher moisture in May. Not surprising, you guys, we all live here. We know what the climate is like going into June, July, August, very relatively low moisture in the soils. And then the moisture ramps up again as we go into the fall. So that's a pretty standard pattern. 2018 was very normal in this regard. This fine and ah. this is okay. Um, so what these folks did, and, and this is the work of Verdant LLC right now, um, they used a device that allows you to measure the photosynthetic uh, efficiency of fern leaflets, okay? And you, go back to the same ferns uh, month after month for the entire year, in fact. And I, I think this we actually ran this for a little more than a year um, to look at this measure called FV over FM. Again, it's a measure of photosynthetic efficiency. And you can see that in May, the values are quite high. We've actually got two sets of plots here. One are my, the 20 plots that I set up these are what we call the monitor, monitoring plots. And then we have an additional set of plots, uh, which theoretically were serving as a control. Um, and these plots maybe are uh, in healthier parts of the park. So at any rate, two sets of plots. Uh, we're doing these measures every month through the entire year. And you can see, again, that the photosynthetic efficiency seems to track the same pattern as the moisture pattern that you see um, in a normal year, and this is 2018. So high efficiency going into the early summer, and then that efficiency drops off going into August, the driest part of the year, and then ramps back up again as the rains return. And this is what we'd expect. Um, and this, these efficiencies around about 80% are uh, quite normal for sword fern. Um, and really this is a, a good baseline. That's what we expected. We also expect this drop off down to about 70% and then recovery as the moisture returns. The dotted red line represents what we consider to be sort of the cutoff for like a very uh, healthy or normal photosynthetic efficiency. And, and again, we expect it to go below that cutoff in the driest months. And again, we see the return, even in these plots that are, you know, theoretically, the, the black line labeled monitoring plots, these are plots that are 
theoretically more stressed by the, um, the pathogen. But again, the, these are average values. So we're not looking at individual ferns here. And this is the key. Um, we needed to do this again, paying more attention to individual ferns, looking specifically at ferns that were symptomatic of the die-off and ferns that were asymptomatic. And this is where Dylan comes in. Whoops. This is where Dylan comes in, um, looking again at FV over FM. It's the uh, photosynthetic efficiency, sometimes called chlorophyll fluorescence. And Dylan is, Dylan's data here show us that, um, well, I should back up and say we have a healthy frond or a set of healthy fronds here. We're looking at many fronds. Uh, healthy first year fronds, healthy second year fronds. These are two controls. So a set of healthy first year fronds, a set of healthy second year fronds, and a set of uh, symptomatic second year fronds. And what we see when we, again, divide or, or look at the data according to the health of the frond, you see um, very big difference between um, healthy fronds versus symptomatic fronds. And the healthy fronds are right up where we expect them to be, um, around 80%. And the uh, unhealthy or the symptomatic fronds are averaging down below 70% for their chlorophyll fluorescence or photosynthetic uh, capability. Okay, so that's, that's really important to note. Um, Dylan also looked at foliar moisture content, which is exactly what it sounds like. And in the same groups of ferns, the symptomatic ferns in Seward Park show much lower foliar moisture content. So low, in fact, that these are these values around uh, one are considered um, quite a high fire danger, actually, which um, actually raises some issues when you think about fire danger in our forests. So again, symptomatic ferns showing low photosynthetic capability or efficiency and very low moisture content. Okay, so to summarize here, symptomatic ferns show reduced water content in, in leaves, control ferns do not. Symptomatic ferns show greatly reduced photosynthetic capability control ferns do not. Um, healthy ferns seem to be less affected by drought. Uh, and this is the seasonal drought. And then they recover. That's what Verdant's data show us, Verdant LLC. That's uh, Matthew Agai and Olga Kildashiva. So what we surmise from this is that drought alone is unlikely to kill sword ferns. Um, and in conclusion, then die-off is likely caused by a pathogen that is exacerbating the ability of these species or of the sword fern to take up water um, and exacerbating in the, in the process photosynthetic efficiency. Okay, so that, that's, I would say, our best conclusion at this point in terms of mechanisms. Um, whoops, and then we need to ask though, um, if, if it's not drought alone, seasonal drought alone, then what is at play? And um, there, we're implying obviously that there's a pathogen at play. So the next question becomes, can we demonstrate the existence of a pathogen? And again, this is where Dylan, uh, Dylan's work and Paul's work come into play. Um, they did this really nice experiment in the lab um, in a lab at UW, actually lab space over there, where they paired in bottles, um, a, and this is the control treatment now, a healthy sword fern frond with another healthy sword fern frond. So they set up this uh, control healthy fronds with healthy fronds. They had many sets of these set up in bottles or beakers in the lab. Then they had another set of fronds, which we call the infected treatment. And it, for the infected treatment, they set up beakers that paired healthy fronds with symptomatic fronds. Okay, and the prediction here is that if there's a pathogen, then the symptomatic frond should be transmitting that pathogen 
to the healthy frond in that infected treatment. And the way they measured um, this potential infection was by, again, monitoring this value FV over FM, which is the photosynthetic efficiency of the plant. Okay, so again, we expect the infected treatments, the, the so-called infected treatment to show low FV over FM and the control treatment to show high F, higher FV over FM. Okay, and again, these are um, paired fronds in beakers in a lab setting. And this is what the data show. Uh, they ran this experiment for uh, nine days and the gray is the control treatment and the yellow is the infected treatment. And you can see initially both treatments are the same in terms of their FV over FM values. Um, both treatments are gonna decline. These are cut fronds in water in a lab. But you can see that the decline in the infected treatment uh, is happening much faster than the control treatment. Um, demonstrating here that, and, and what, what they're measuring is the healthy frond or the frond that was healthy uh, be, before it was paired with the symptomatic frond. And, and what you see is these healthy fronds in the infected treatment are somehow picking up that pathogen from their um, symptomatic frond and, and as a result demonstrating this rapid decline in FV over FM, uh, rapid and greater decline than what we see in the control treatment, which again are two healthy fronds paired with each other. Okay, and this, these results are significant. Um, and, and again, they have multiple samples going for each treatment, the control and the infected. Okay, so this is evidence of transmission of a pathogen. And uh, it's not clear how that pathogen would have been transmitted, whether it was through the water or through the air, but most likely through the water, because uh, if it had been through the air, everything would have become uh, infected. Okay. Um, I want to show you another field experiment now showing transmission in the field. And this is a very clever experiment devised by Paul Shannon. Um, so what we have here are two areas in Seward Park. One area that in the lower left that we're calling the old die-off zone where all the ferns are dead. The hypothesis here is that there's the host plants are gone basically, and that the pathogen is likely also to be absent at this point. The, in other words, the uh, pathogen has run its course, the die-off has run its course here. Now we have another area of the park where die-off is active, where ferns, healthy ferns are actively dying. Okay, the hypothesis there is the pathogen is present and active. And these arrows represent the direction of spread of the pathogen outward from this central area. Okay, and what we're going to do here, and what we have done, in fact, is uh, we are doing ex we've done experimental plantings in each of these areas. So in the old die-off zone, we've planted twelve rows, or sorry, uh, twenty-four plants in two rows. These are ferns, and in the active die-off zone, we have a row of uh, twelve more plants. Okay, these are nursery. I believe nursery grown plants, okay? Um, and so they're, they're planted out here in the old die-off zone and the active die-off zone. And the prediction then is that in the old die-off zone, these ferns will remain healthy because the um, pathogen has already run its course. And in the uh, active die-off zone, these plants will uh, show symptoms of die-off because the pathogen is active here, okay? So they'll end up symptomatic. And in fact, that's exactly what we've shown after 50 months of running this experiment. In the active die-off zone, all of the plants um, are showing reduced numbers of fronds per fern. In fact, um, these numbers would be even lower, except that uh, Paul just reported uh, recovery in one of the ferns. Um, and in the old die-off zone, uh, these plants are healthy and maintaining 
their fronds, okay? Um, so again, demonstrating transmission or active transmission happening in the active die-off zone. And, and encouragingly, absence of the pathogen in the old die-off zone, which suggests to us that we can begin more active restoration in the old die-off zone. Here's what this actually looks like in the field. Um, I took this photo today. This is the old die-off zone with two rows of planted ferns all thriving here, okay? And again, this was an area that had almost 100% mortality um, in 2015. So summary of evidence for the pathogen. I'm almost done here with the talk, um, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, we've got symptomatic ferns. Uh, so in the lab, symptomatic ferns seem to spread their symptoms to asymptomatic ferns, probably via the water. Okay. In the field, uh, we have greater mortality in active die-off zones. Okay, demonstrating that yeah, the, the the pathogen is still active in these places. Transmission is somehow occurring through the environment in those zones. Again, maybe through water, maybe through the soil. Um, we have little, and, and this is this is interesting. We have little new mortality in old die-off zones. Okay, suggesting again that the pathogen has run its course in those zones. So in summary, the die-off is characterized by gradual death, failure to produce fiddleheads, decreased ability to take up water. Um, the die-off is active and spreading, but I would argue perhaps less virulent than it was in back in 2015 when we were seeing these just massive declines and die-offs um, with nearly 100% mortality in some places. So in other words, the death rate is lowering. Um, I was really encouraged actually when I visited one of our sites on Mercer Island earlier this week and also on Tiger Mountain, two sites that we had um, identified as potentially severe sites. I had expected to see a scene much like what we had seen or have seen over the years in Seward Park, but actually was encouraged that um, the, the die-off seems to not be spreading as much as I had thought there, if at all. We're not actually collecting data, uh, formal data in these places. We're doing more photo monitoring just because we don't have the research permission for these places, but um, it's encouraging. Um, and again, Seward Park North, north end of the peninsula, uh, spreading, but I would argue not to the extent it would be 100% mortality we've seen in other parts of the park. Um, Die-off is evident throughout the region, but again, few sites as severe as Seward Park. Exceptions to this, however, uh, Bainbridge Island, and I, I haven't been out there in a couple of years. I need to go resurvey our site in Fort Ward, um, and just across from the Island Wood. Um, Environmental Education Center. Uh, we have a site there that looks a lot like Seward Park with huge amounts of mortality and some sites on the Kitsap Peninsula and Quilcene that are also quite severe that we need to get out and resurvey. Um, the mechanism of die-off is probably a pathogen um, causing damage to the vascular system of these plants, uh, which again is exacerbated by summer seasonal drought and heat, okay? So that's our best guess for the mechanism right now. Um, so next steps, we're doing restoration with all tools available. Um, we have these so-called Lazarus ferns that um, David Parasso cultivated from one fern that survived in one of these hardest hit areas. It was a fern that we we're guessing is probably resistant to the pathogen. Um, and so we have these all these baby Lazarus ferns that we're planting out in an experimental way through active uh, die-off areas along with control ferns that come from nurseries to see if this so-called Lazarus fern, these propagules from the Lazarus fern are gonna provide um, sort of immunity to this ongoing uh, die-off. And so that, that's active, that experiment is ongoing, just started uh, earlier this year, and we'll see how that 
plays out. Uh, we're also doing restoration, and this is a Green Seattle partnership with other species as well. And I'm showing you a baby vaccinium here planted in the midst of all these dead sword ferns. Uh, we're also thinking about planting next to coarse woody debris. Again, coming back to that study that showed uh, better survival near logs and trees. So thinking about that as a strategy for restoration, perhaps even placing some coarse woody debris would be a good idea. Also monitoring for natural regeneration. And again, we're seeing um, occasionally in a few places, some of these sword fern crowns coming back to life and or reproduction, uh, perhaps by spore um, in some of these areas as well. Um, still rare at this point, but definitely occurring. So we're gonna continue local and regional monitoring, um, surveying healthy comparison sites like Discovery Park, for example. Um, Schmitz Park, maybe um, Point Defiance Park and Tacoma. Um, fine scale monitoring of abiotic and biotic factors associated with die off. And we really need more of this. There's so many potential factors and it's just hard to stay on top of everything, but uh, we need to do that. Um, and this is something we've started is high throughput sequencing of the microbiomes of infected and uninfected fronds to really try and detect a potential pathogen, whether it's a virus or a bacteria. Um, um, we, we, we need to understand the microbiome better. And we, we've, again, we've done a little bit of this, but it's been inconclusive so far. Um, additional analysis of the anatomy of dead and dying ferns. And then this is something great that Paul Shannon has started. We're doing broader scale forest monitoring right now. And again, coming back to this stress in the forest, we're seeing massive die off of Western Hemlock in Seward Park right now trying to get a handle on that and uh, trying to also just set, get a baseline survey of some of our major tree species within the magnificent forest. And that's gonna be really important for the future, for understanding the future of this urban forest going forward. And we want Seward Park and we think of Seward Park as a kind of a research hub for urban forests and forestry. And, um, Paul has been really great at engaging the community on this, including uh, through this group Choose 180, where we have a number of uh, students who have been out in the forest helping to do these surveys. Um, so that's a, a great new direction and just building that momentum. Yeah. Oops. And then finally, we do need your help. Uh, we'll put this link in the chat as well. This is our iNaturalist page where you can log your own observations when you're out there hiking around. Um, and we encourage you to include photos and any detailed description you can. Okay, so that is way more talking than you probably wanted, but that is uh, as much as I know, and that's where we are. And again, this is the work of so many people in actually what's quite an amazing collaboration, I think, of citizen scientists and naturalists. Um, so I will take your questions. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. That was excellent a fascinating and perplexing topic. Um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we do have quite a number of questions and I'll just launch right in and hopefully we can get you out of here by 8.30ish. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, Somebody would like to know if this, if there's any evidence of this spreading to other ferns like deer fern. Um, I would say no, um, not that I know of, and that's quite an interesting question. And, and again, I think evidence that it's not likely to be drought as the sole cause of this, because if it were drought, um, you would expect to see drought stress in other ferns and, and other species around the forest. and. Uh, I mean, honestly, hemlock, western hemlock may be sensitive to drought. Um, it, it is one of the one of the tree species that needs more water, um, maybe, and is certainly less tolerant of these hot summer temperatures. But uh, but yeah, to answer your question, no, we haven't seen it in other ferns. And in fact, we have a, um, a Polysticum andersonii in um, Seward Park growing in the midst of an active 
die off zone. And, and it's another Polysticum even quite, a, it's one of the rare ones and it has not shown um, uh, any evidence of dieback. So that, that was a individual plant that Dylan actually found uh, when he was working out there. Oh, wow, that's interesting. Oh. Um, this person wants to know whether there's big leaf maple decline in Seward Park. Um, that is a great question. And I would, to my, to my knowledge and observation, I would say no. But if, if anything is thriving, it's um, a big leaf maple. Yeah. Um, now that said, I have seen um, big leaf maple stress around the neighborhood in um, areas that are more exposed to direct sunlight, so. Mm -hmm. Are the observations only in public parks or also submitted for private residences? Uh, we'd love submissions from private residences. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in fact, one of our sites is a private residence out on the Kitsap Peninsula. Rita Moore uh, says, I live in a ravine on the east side of Mercer Island. 20 years ago, I started restoring my half acre with native plants. Sword ferns are a major part of my design. Most of the ferns were salvaged at WNPS plant salvages. I now have sword fern die off. If I prune ferns, should I have a separate pair of clippers for the dying ones? Is it okay to put the sick fronds in the compost bins? And should I dig out the old dead fern roots? Mm. Um, those are all great questions. And I would say to the first question about clipping fronds, I would definitely say to clean your clippers. And that's something we try to be careful about as well as cleaning our shoes. I mean, who knows? I, I mean, in Seward Park, like everyone and his brother is hiking out there, which is great. And 99% of those people are not cleaning their shoes, but um, yeah, um, I, I'd say be careful. Um, and I, I don't know um, if, if you want to, uh, I mean, this sounds kind of crazy, but if you want to contribute to this, um, you could actually maybe take some data on the patterns that you see and uh, um, kind of pay attention to where you've been and where the die off spreads and stuff like that. But that's, I, I'm sorry to hear that you're seeing the symptoms in your area. Um, so, uh, we, but we do know that it is, it's present on Mercer Island, um, especially in Upper Luther Burbank Park. So uh, I, I hope that answered the question. I know there were some other parts to it and I, it, it's hard to know, like, should you dig them up? Um, maybe, um, <laughs> on the other hand, may, maybe they'll come back to life. Um, we've certainly seen a few of them that have of these uh, kind of root crowns that have recovered and put up a, a stunted frond um, at least, so yeah. Is water table monitoring part of the future study? I mean, that's a great question and something we've certainly thought about that's been proposed as an issue, but I mean, we're right next to Lake Washington, um, so <laughs> I mean, I don't know, I, I guess maybe I don't know enough about water tables to whether that lens of water table fluctuates significantly on the peninsula, but it's easy to see where the water table is and some of our, you know, the lake level anyway. And, uh, you know, some of our die off is happening pretty close to the lake at this point. So, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things we, probably could and should monitor for, um, but all of us are kind of doing this on our spare time. So, uh, which we don't have a lot of. Right. But no, it's a great question. I appreciate the question. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> um, this person would like to know what median temperatures are. Oh, that's a great question. Um, offhand, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I mean, I, I feel like I should, I, I just don't know it offhand. Um, and, and I mean, there's different ways to measure it too, I suppose, or do you, do you include nighttime temperatures and daytime or, um, 
you know, what, what time of day are you measuring? Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know offhand. I, I just know from our conversations with, um, I, I believe it was a postdoctoral researcher in Cliff Mass's lab, but uh, we, what we've seen in the last 10 years is not, you know, with, with, apart from these record high temperatures, which are very important to consider um, that, that temperatures haven't been too out of the ordinary on average, so. so. So back to Rita, she wants to know what she can plant to replace the sword fern that is dying in her ravine. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think you should try any number of native plants um, that um, you know are standard in restoration. Um, so, I mean, you, you could certainly try sword ferns. Um, but like I said, it, it, in, in our experience, I think it's probably better to wait until you're not seeing active die off um, before you plant sword ferns again. So, but I, yeah, I I'd probably want to look at the uh, specifics of that site and, you know, how it sounds like a quite a moist area um, and probably quite shaded. So, um, I, I mean, uh, Oso Berry is a, a great one. Um, so, but there's any number of other things, vaccinium, um, some of the vacciniums anyway. Um, yeah. Great. Um, another person with a private ravine in Northwest Seattle, um, just checked my yard and all new plantings from the past two years, in addition to the older pre-existing ones, are very obviously dying. Some, uh, some of them are from local nurseries, other from the conservation district sales. A good number are uphill from pre-existing ferns. Who should I contact about the management of this die-off? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question, and maybe there's someone here in WNPS who knows or would could make a recommendation on that. I mean, I would say at the very least it, it maybe is concerning if you see a pattern with ferns coming out of one particular nursery, and that that was something we were actually very concerned about initially was that we thought we had an issue with Phytophthora and we were trying to, and, and we, we know that there's some nurseries in the area that have had issues with that and potentially have released um, the Phytophthora, the A Phytophthora pathogen out into wild environments around here. Um, so now, now, I mean, if it's so the, you know, the die off syndrome, then yeah, I doubt that a nursery would be responsible for that. Um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, if if you're concerned about the die off, though, then then you know, please, if you don't mind, you know, maybe make a note of it on uh, on our iNaturalist page. I'm about to post that link, and then um, you know, may, maybe one of us can come out and take a look. I, I you know, obviously. Um, you, you, now you know as much as I know about the issue, um, so we're probably not going to be able to solve it for you. But, um, but yeah. Um, anyway, I hope that answered the question. I, I apologize if I, I didn't answer it. Um, Rita, again, should she, should she water her ferns in summer? <laughs> oh yeah, that that's a great question actually, and and I would say yes. Um, to that, especially if you're doing restoration work of any kind, it's important to water during that first year, even if they're out in the woods. And uh, we try to do that in Seward Park, actually, with any of our restoration plantings. Now, I mean, if we're doing experimental work, we have to be a little bit more careful about how we do that and, uh, and that we're doing treating all the treatments in a uniform way. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely, I recommend watering. And, you know, given what we know at this point, I would say that uh, water um, is, you know, abundant water it mitigates against the effects of whatever the die-off is. So, um, 
So that, that seems like a good idea to me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, one attendee says you may have covered this before she logged on, but do you worry about the pathogens spreading in the soil clinging to the shoes of scientists or on their instruments? Um, I do worry about that, to be honest. Um, and like I say, we, we try to be careful about that. Um, I, I feel like, yeah, you know, so, so if I'm, if I'm walking around areas of the park that are, um, you know, these known fairly severely infected areas, I, um, don't change my shoes, but I do try to avoid walking from an area with active infection to other areas of the park, um, that are, have healthy ferns. Um, and I, you know, if I, if I want to do that, then I, I come back with a different pair of shoes. Um, now, so, so I, I worry it's again, hard to, you know, we, we haven't really pinned down the vector for transmission. Um, and like I say, in a public park, everyone is walking around there anyway. I mean, and they're literally dogs running off leash throughout the forest on occasion, even though they're not supposed to be. So um, there's a lot of potential vectors. So you, you just kind of have to weigh the pros and cons, but I, I would say be careful for sure if you can, if you have that option. So, yeah. Okay. Um, the next person wants to know whether you've ever worked with Dr. Sharon Doty and whether there are known pathogens for other ferns. Um, yeah, so we know Sharon Doty. Um, Sharon has, um, in fact, taken a look at this. Her conclusion was that um, she, she thinks drought is uh, mostly responsible for this. Um, so that, that's her opinion. Um, she tried to look at this a little bit in her lab um, using slightly different techniques. And, and to the best of our knowledge, um, she was, she, she tried to replicate some of the transmission work, but she didn't run the experiment for long enough. And she did some, uh, did some things a little differently. Um, so yeah, so, so we, we do know uh, Sharon, we know her, her work. Um, and uh, yeah, um, she did not have any great suggestions to my knowledge. Um, but I, the, the plan was, so, so she, she's quite well known for uh, these ways of, I think, inoculating against pathogens. And so that was the idea was that we would work with her to um, somehow isolate a pathogen and then somehow inoculate uh, or design. Um, and, I, and I forget exactly how she does it, to be honest. It sounds like the person asking the question may know more about what she does. Um, but uh, but yeah, it, I, she she looked at it for a little bit, and and uh, I, as far as I know, she's not interested in continuing to work on it. But uh, mm -hmm. we'd we'd welcome her uh, collaboration if she wanted to get involved again. So, um, thank you. Next question is: uh, How do you keep mountain beaver beavers from eating your new fern plantings? <laughs> you haven't indicated that they do, but um... yeah. that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, you know, as far as I know, they haven't been eating our new fern plantings, which is interesting. But they're definitely prevalent in some of these areas, not all of them. Um, they are they're absent on Mercer Island, as far as I know. But but yeah, they're fairly common in in, in uh, Seward Park. Um, they definitely eat the mature ferns and uh, you know, they'll just snip off fronds, um, especially in winter and they'll, they'll pile them up outside their burrows. Um, but yeah, so I guess we haven't really had an issue with the young ferns. Um, and I, I don't know if Paul Shannon is on this call, but if um, I, I should have invited Paul and Dylan or any of the other folks to weigh in if I'm uh, off base on any of these answers. 
but uh, yeah, as far as I know, we haven't had the issue. Uh, I, I am concerned about the boroughs though a little bit. There, there are parts of Seward Park where it's like a minefield of boroughs. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, and interesting enough, when they burrow underneath a fern that leaves the, uh, um, the rhizome sort of just hanging out there. Um, <coughs> and so we were concerned actually that the boroughs might in fact um, contribute to drought stress. Now, I don't, necessarily think that's a big factor because you know the ferns and the mountain beavers have co-evolved um, but uh, um, it, 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 I'm glad you brought it up because mountain beavers are uh, and interactions with ferns are something we looked at for a while and we actually built some exclosures to try and keep mountain beavers out of some of the areas but we, we didn't actually see any effect of the beavers on the ferns uh, when we excluded them. They were still die off within the exclosures. So. Um, next question, is it possible that sword ferns are dependent on soil mycorrhizae? And the problem is with something that is attacking that. Near a tree, the trees may be influencing subsoil components, mm -hmm. uh, question mark. Yeah, that, that's something we've thought about for sure. Um, I personally don't have the skills to uh, cultivate mycorrhizae or, or even detect different species of mycorrhizae, but, but that is something we have thought about. And, and you're absolutely right, especially with survival close to trees, there may be a mycorrhizal network there that um, somehow the fern is tapping into, or simply that, again, the mycorrhizae are drawing water into that area. Um, I, I should know the answer as to whether sword ferns have specific mycorrhizae that they associate with. Um, I don't know the answer to that offhand, but um, it def definitely something we've thought about and, and need to look at and need someone with expertise to help us. Mm. Ah, um. Andy McKinnon is coming in in September. Oh, oh great. <laughs> um, there's a few more questions here. I know we said we'd let you go by 30. Do you, uh, if I wrap it up in the, in five minutes, is that okay? Yeah. Wanna... No, th this is, this is fine. I, I, you know, I'm actually very happy to answer questions. The fact that this has gone on long is my own fault for creating such a long presentation. So uh, I always get great ideas from people asking great questions. So uh, this is helpful to our whole team. So I appreciate this and I, I'm happy to hang out as long as people want to hang out. Perhaps okay. I could add uh, 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 so, something uh, 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 quickly. Uh, this was Paul Shannon. Yeah. So um, uh, the um, um, many of the, 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 the questions and the uh, that, that Tim has uh, uh, so ably um, uh, posed. Um, I think that um, everyone might understand that we've um, um, reached the um, the effective limits of, of um, citizen and pro bono science. Um, I, I think that the the last question, the the one about uh, Michael Reisel networks is a good example of that. Um, that um, it uh, takes uh, sustained, sustained, sustained skill, and so the um, uh, Friends of Seward Park has uh, set aside ten thousand dollars from book sales in order to make a film uh, to um, get the word out on the good work that could be done at, at uh, Seward as, as sort of a, a miner's canary of um, problems in forest health. And we ho hope to, through that film, um, uh, raise the funds so that these hard and important and interesting questions uh, can be pursued by, by, by um, pro professionals who are paid to do so. That's our hope. Well, more more power to you. I hope it it 
gets the brings in the attention it deserves. Um, a few more questions here. If the pathogen spreads by water, would ferns at higher altitudes in the park be less likely to contract the pathogen, assuming water mostly flows downhill? Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's a great question. Um, and that's something we, yeah, initially were looking for. Um, I would not say that we've seen yeah, downhill migration per se. And, and so, so, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, that, that seems logical and that's something we had been looking for. It's not the pattern we've seen. So, um, yeah, you know, again, like it, it, it's, I, I'm, I'm at a little bit of a loss, um, for sure. Um, we, we, yeah. And I, I know I said that potentially it was spread through water. Um, we don't, know that for sure, we, but we do know that the two fronds were placed in the same um, beaker of water. Um, it may have been spread by contact of the fronds. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, this is a great question and, and you know, we, we need to get to the bottom of it. And uh, um, it's just, it's been frustrating to be honest. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so. And, and this is something that um, Jenny Glass and uh, Marianne Elliott were helping us with um, initially, and they, they've been wonderful. Um, in, in fact, when we were looking at Phytophthora, that was our major hypothesis that um, you know Phytophthora might be spreading through water in the soil and migrating downward um, through the fern populations. Um, it just wasn't really what we saw in the long run though. And, and in the end, we also never detected any species of Phytophthora that uh, would cause die off. But, uh, but yeah, um, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a logical question. I don't have a good answer. So, yeah. There's more questions or comments here. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm jumped from the Q and A to the, chat now and so they're not chronological and I think you've answered some of this but the, the questions are concern the mycorrhizal fungal network um, and whether sword ferns may share mycorrhizal fungi with big leaf maple and and could there be ha something happening in that network mm -hmm. um, I yeah it, it's a great question um yeah, and I, I'm kind of embarrassed that I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I'll have to just put that on my list of things to look into. Yeah. Um, I, I I don't know if Dylan is on the call or um, um, or Paul. Do you know the answer to uh, whether do, do we know what species the sword ferns, what species of mycorrhizal fungi the sword ferns use or share with? Uh, I'm afraid I don't. Yeah, yeah, okay. There's just a lot we don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, but I, I mean, like I said, I one of the fascinating things about doing this work is I feel like we know so much more about sword ferns than any of us knew in the beginning. And, and it's like this super common species that, you know, we've, we've sort of taken for granted forever. Um, it's not commercially um, that important, maybe, maybe in the floral industry, but, um, it, 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 you know, yet it's so common and, and we, we knew comparatively so little about it, um, despite the fact that it's just right in front of us and sometimes the major species in the understory. Um, so, so anyway, I mean, that said, you know, there will always be more to know and, uh, very clearly there's a lot more we need to know, but it, it's been, very rewarding to figure out what we figured out, um, even even if like somewhat slightly dissatisfying when you know that the the answers are still eluding us. So, yeah, per, um, perhaps I can add a a couple things there. Um, the um, Polyphysicum genus expert uh, David uh, uh, Barrington at the University of 
Brabant uh, told us um, that um, the survival of individual plants for a thousand years is not out of the question, um, which is just extraordinary. And um, th th they're um, thought to uh, um, uh, very successfully um, survive stand replacement fires. And then uh, um, a completely unsubstantiated idea is that with the um, lowering of the lake a century ago um, by I think 11 feet and then um, uh, perhaps due to the hard paving of the, the road that um, surrounds the peninsula that um, both the water table and conjectured um, mycorrhizal transport for the lake has led to Seward's um, uh, force sort of slowly, steadily weakening over that century. But, but, but as I say, that's just conjecture at this point. We don't know if that's actually true. Um, the, here's a comment. Uh, um, this person wanted to pass on that the talk was very interesting and not too much information at all. And that comes with a thank you. Okay, um, the next question is, how can we discern ordinary senescence or heat dome effects from the die-off syndrome? I don't know if we've, with just one heat dome, I'm not sure <laughs> that we know whether there are any long-standing effects. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. So um, we, we're, we're, you know, hoping to look at ferns in, you know, healthy fern populations to understand what normal senescence looks like. And as Paul said, you know, these ferns are extremely long lived, um, you know, as, and, and yeah, so, so I think senescence is, and so we're talking about fern death here. And I, and I think it, you know, is, yeah, it, I don't know, year to year death within individuals within any population is, is low. Um, but, but yes, we need to establish what normal is in a normal healthy forest. And, you know, that said, I would also say that, you know, emphasize that these ferns, sword ferns are found in Southern California as well. Um, and, you know, tolerant of temperatures are av certainly average temperatures that are much higher than what we have here in Seward Park. So, you know, you know, maybe different genetic stock down there, but, uh, it, it's clear that they are capable of withstanding pretty wide variation and including direct, you know, um, like, like continuous direct sunlight in clear cuts after forestry, um, which is also pretty remarkable. Now we do know that they um, shorten their fronds when they have are continuously exposed to heat and sunlight and there's been some good documentation of that this adjustment of uh for, or frond phenology essentially to counteract continued um heat and sunlight stress um I, and i'm sorry paul did, were you going to jump in and say something there oh yeah there's a um, um, a paper from uh, uh 2015 um by joanna pitterman at usc and it's called not dead yet, and she studied the um, um, uh, um, loss of fronds, but then the complete recovery of uh, ferns after the, I think, uh, four or five years of the very severe um, Southern and Central California drought. Um, yeah. Not dead yet is the title of the paper. Yeah. And there's some really interesting work going on down in California. Um, I forget the name of that group, but I think it might be savetheredwoods.org. Mm. And uh, they, they're doing some of their own fern studies down there associated with very extreme drought, um, you know, much more severe than anything we have or have had up here. Um, and, um, I, and I believe they have an insect pathogen or have had an identified insect pathogen down there that's exacerbated the issue but but again like like ferns are not they're not going extinct there and and uh, um yeah they seem very resilient and able to adapt in in uh in different ways whether that's going dormant for 
some period of time and coming back or modifying their growth structure. Um, but uh, but it, it has been interesting to look at the research coming out of California on a you know separate uh, sword fern stress event, let's say. Um, another person here is wondering whether to dig up or leave the dead roots. Did we? It. Um, um yeah, I, I, I would say it's probably okay to leave them as far as we know that, um, I mean, what we've shown so far is that if there's transmission happening, it seems to be in the, the living or, or uh, stressed symptomatic fronds and uh, probably not in the root itself. Um, and if, if anything, uh, it seems like occasionally the roots recover when the pathogen has presumably run its course. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I, yeah, I wouldn't advocate going around digging up all the rhizomes at this point. That sounds a little bit extreme, potentially. Um, may, maybe I'll change my tune with more evidence at a later date. So, yeah, Paul Talbert is typing in some interesting uh, tidbits of information here into the chat about uh, vascular or muscular mycorrhizae. Uh, so there you go. Um, and just so everyone's aware, I did put those links into the chat. I, uh, I think I sent them to the wrong group. <laughs> I, I sent them to the hosts at first, but now it's posted oh. to everyone. So there's two links there. One is the iNaturalist site where you can log your observations. Oh my gosh, I, I posted the iNaturalist thing in twice. Um, let me get that link to, I'm gonna post these again and I'm gonna also get that link to Paul Shannon's map, which is right here. So you're probably looking at my um, as we do this. So here's that link to Paul Shannon's map. And I'll get the iNaturalist link again, just in case. Go ahead, Shelley. Oh, there's uh, several people thanking you for the interesting presentation and that they're gonna be keeping their eyes peeled for new um, die off areas um, while hiking. Um, one person wants to know if you, you've looked into the problem of problem being a die-off of a defensive organism that would normally keep an endemic pathogen in, che in check. Oh yeah, um, well that, that's an interesting idea. Um, so the question is, yeah, what would that be? Um, but yeah, no, no, I guess we haven't really looked into that. Um, I mean, you know, it certainly, so I, I started my talk by acknowledging the fact that, you know, fire has been a part of this ecosystem, uh, both large stand replacing fires and smaller fires that uh, were intentionally set by the Duwamish people. And um, this is not a species, obviously, but, but uh, um, you know, I, my guess is that periodic fires keep pathogens in check and, uh, you know, it's certainly worth thinking about um, is uh, whether we, we ought to somehow bring fire back to this ecosystem. And uh, I mean, that's probably not going to happen in an urban park, but uh, uh, it's certainly interesting to think about and how one would do that and what the quote, natural fire regime is. Um, you know, some would say, well, a stand replacing fire is the natural fire regime. I'm not sure that's what we want, but yeah. as I said, you know, the Duwamish people uh, were doing light burns in this ecosystem for millennia. And so, you know, the ferns in this region and in, in particular in this park um, have co-evolved with that practice of light burning, um, intentional light burning. And so, you know, may, maybe that's, I, yeah, I, I think it, you could make a strong argument that we need to bring back something like that. Yeah. So. Well, I think we've gotten um, close to the or at to the end of the questions. Um, there's 
some people have been commenting, Paul Shannon and Paul Talbert, and there's some interesting information in the chat to be gleaned if 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 uh, you're following that. And um, this presentation is recorded, so if people want to go back and listen to this again, you'll have that um, chance. It will be posted on the website. Um, we have a YouTube channel and usually Denise gets them up there pretty quickly. So um, I'm not sure. I, I think Denise keeps a record of the chat and if anybody really needs to see the what's in the chat, um, we might be able to ask her uh, to to send that out to me or someone else, and I could relay the information. Denise has been very busy lately, so we don't want to ask too much of her right now. But um, yeah, well, maybe we can get the iNaturalist link and perhaps the link to that map into one of your next, I don't know, group emails or something. Um, sure. And, you know, I, I don't know if it sounds like you don't have more talks coming up. Here. Not for a couple put of the, months. I'll yeah, put yeah. the iNaturalist link underneath the link to the video as oh, an perfect. additional resource. Perfect. Okay. So, um, that can be there. And Shelly, I can send you a copy of the chat. Okay. Even yeah. Once and, that, they can contact Central Puget Sound at WMPS.org. Okay. That sounds great. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Tim and also Paul, um, really interesting. And we'll, as things continue to develop, we'll probably ask you back again for your an update in another year or two. Yeah, well, I hope we actually have a like a really compelling update. Um, but but yeah, no, thank you so much. It's great to talk about what we're doing, and you know, I, I think we really do have a unique community here around. Seward Park and um, uh, led by Paul Shannon and and uh, yeah I, I hope that you yeah got some inspiration for what a group of determined people can do in terms of you know citizen science around a place that we all know and love in our neighborhood so um, um, yeah thank you all and uh, yeah come come to, come down here and visit um, if you're down in Seward Park, let us know, so. Great, well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great presentation. Okay. And I guess we'll- Yeah, have a good night. Yeah, bye-bye now.